Stand up. There you go. You were dreaming. What's up everybody, and welcome to the first full review here on the channel. And what better place to start than with the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind release 2002 by Bethesda and the Todd Howard Boys Club. As far as mods go, the only mods I'm going to be using here in this video are the Morrowind Graphics Extender, because it strangely helps the game run better on my PC, as well as the Morrowind Code Patch to help out with all those bugs. The vanilla game has a much more foggy feel to it, but I find the world to retain all of its soul and mystery with my setup. Also, here is your official spoiler warning, though I will not be talking about any DLC in this video, that will come at a later date in its own review. And if you like the video, like it below and remember to subscribe. Well, what a shocker. You're a prisoner to start out an RPG. It's sort of generic, but that's alright. We start aboard a vessel heading to Morrowind, the ancestral homeland of the Dark Elves a land rich with a history of warfare and living gods walking the earth. You're sent here by the order of one Emperor Uriel Septim VII. Sounds pretty damn important. And once you hop off the boat, you're immediately met with some pretty big decisions as you're going to craft your character. Though if you aren't picking a Dunmer or Redguard, what the hell are you doing? You have a ton of freedom here in character creation, where you can either pick a pre-built class or build one for yourself and give it a silly name. You select minor and major skills and then regret your choices just moments after you hit confirm. But from here, you're pretty much set loose in the world with just the simple task of finding a guy named Caius in Balmora. Now, this is the point where anyone who is playing this for the first time after playing Oblivion and or Skyrim might start to panic. There's very little voice acting, no quest markers, no fast travel, you're super slow. I mean, what the hell do I do? Well, to those people, I urge you to just calm down, take a breath, and just start walking around. Talk to people. Get ready to read and read a lot. Morrowind sets you up to figure out most of this stuff on your own, and I really love that aspect of it personally. I wish more modern RPGs just kind of plopped you down with a vague task and left you alone. There are a million places to go, a million things to do, quests and factions, heroes and villains. The feeling of all of those things existing in this mysterious world and waiting to be found is a very exciting one. One of the first things I noticed, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, is that the landscape and the aesthetic is not what you'd expect going into a fantasy RPG. Things are strange, almost alien. Huge mushrooms, giant insects, this really foreign architecture. This is one of the great strengths of Morrowind that for many people puts this game head and shoulders above its sequels. Morrowind as the region is a land of volcanoes and ash, but also great swamps, rocky coastal settlements, and highland passes. Dark elf design and art are everywhere, inspired by the carapaces of local wildlife, while you are also still able to detect imperial influence in the region with more traditional buildings and forts as well. These details and distinction give the landscape a story, and every location you visit a local history that's enforced when you dig in and start talking to locals, doing quests, wherever you may find yourself. The great houses of Morrowind play a huge role in these things too, but we'll cover factions later on in the video. Every biome you visit, exterior, interior, have a certain hum about them in Morrowind. A very specific atmosphere that I find incredibly cozy and soulful. I mean, if you really want to lose yourself in the scale and majesty of this game, early on, trot on down to Vivek City and just walk around. Try to figure out the pattern of the city and talk to some of the locals. Dwemer Ruins are also particularly good in this game to me. Skyrim's Dwemer Ruins are certainly more flashy, but the visual style inside and out of the ruins in Morrowind have a more distinct, less shiny and steampunk look to them that I really appreciate. They feel to me more like ancient dwellings of a long gone race, opposed to a workshop with just endless corridors, though I'm not by any means bashing those. All of the visual eye candy and atmospheric energy is propped up by an incredible soundtrack by Jeremy Soule. Many of the tracks that play when you're just out exploring have a very somber feeling to them, which I always really liked. Shed Your Travails is definitely my favorite track, and every time it comes on, I bump that thing up. I will say though that the combat music annoys the hell out of me, it just abruptly cuts in even if the stupid cliff racer is like 30 feet away from me. But to be fair, I usually hate combat music period in games, and I opt to turn it off or use a mod to disable it if possible. The voice acting that is present is actually all really solid, especially that of our main villain. Come Nerevar, friend or traitor, come. Come and look upon the heart and a Kulakan. 
the visual art style married with really strong sound create a very convincing and strange high fantasy setting that is unlike anything you've seen or experienced before this, I'm sure of that. So, now that we're plopped down in Morrowind, tasked with finding a skooma-addicted naked man, what's the point of it all? Well, brother, if there's one reason to download this game right now, it is for the story and lore. So this is the main spoiler section, if you care, so beware. What starts off as a pretty tame main quest quickly has you at the center of a very large event here in Morrowind. So you're recruited into the Blades by Caius, and you're quickly out participating with guilds and seeing the world. All the while, you're chasing down clues about something called the Nerevarine Prophecy. So, a little history lesson. Indiril Nerevar was an ancient Chimer hero, king, and warrior. He created what is known as the First Council with the Dwemer back in the First Era, way before the events of the game. Eventually, sadly, that alliance fell apart and resulted in the epic Battle of Red Mountain, which you may have heard of. Now, sometime before the battle, the Dwemer people had discovered the Heart of Lorcan, an insanely powerful artifact that Dwemer engineer Kagernak desired to use to build a mechanical god. This plan was discovered by a little character named Vorin Dagoth, and quickly reported to Nerevar and the other Chimer leadership of the tribunal. Nerevar and the Chimer then waged war on the Dwemer to stop such a quote, profane act. Nerevar led his people in the war well and was a dominant force on the battlefield. But something very odd happened during this battle. Kagernak activated the Brass God and all of the Dwemer people instantly vanished from existence at the height of the war. Also, somehow at the end of the war, Nerevar was slain. This is an event with many different possible causes, disputed by different characters here in game. Some say that he died in battle with the Dwemer leader Dumak. Some say that his good friend Vorin Dagoth turned on him and slayed him. Some say that the tribunal of Vivek Sothasil and Almalexia poisoned their leader so that they could take the tools of the deceased Kagernak without consequence. That's what I think happened. But what you believe doesn't really matter, as either way, the great hero of the Chimer people was dead. The members of the tribunal had made a pact not to use Kagernak's instruments for any selfish gain, but oopsie, they did just that. By using the tools on the heart of Lorcan, they became living gods, cursed their people to become the Dunmer, and still walk the land of Morrowind today as we are starting our journey. So, the Nerevarine prophecy speaks of the Daedric Prince Azura resurrecting the fallen Nerevar to deal with the inflated ego and corruption of the tribunal, amongst other things. The prophecy is set into seven trials for the so-called Nerevarine to overcome and prove themselves, with the final trial stating, His mercy frees the cursed false gods, binds the broken, and redeems the mad. Now, we have to accept that Morrowind lore is almost purposely contradictory and confusing. The developers, I think, wanted to create a game with tons of theory crafting and lore loopholes, stuff like that. So you would think that with all of this, the Tribunal is the main villain, and you would be sort of right or wrong. So the main bad guy, gameplay-wise, is Dagoth Ur. I made an entire video on him that I highly recommend you watch for the full scoop, but he is the previously mentioned Vorin Dagoth that had been cuddling up with the Heart of Lorcan far too long and accidentally became an insane walking god who's attempting to build a second brass god just like the Dwemer did inside of Red Mountain. All the while, he's spreading crippling diseases and vampirism throughout the entire continent. He plans on going in a crusade with this brass god under his forgotten great house banner of Dagoth and taking no prisoners in the process. Okay, so does this sound crazy enough? And this is just the lore that you're going to uncover as you progress through the main storyline early on. And guess what? Yes. You are the prophesized Nerevarine who has been sent here unknowingly to pretty much right every wrong in Morrowind. So the main quest is epic and massive in scale with tons to explore and discover about all of these characters and historical events in the region. But it's surprising to realize that nearly everything else is of just as high quality as the main quest. There's of course boring filler quests and dead spots here and there with some of them just being too tedious for me to even complete. But for the most part, it feels like even random NPC interactions on the road are memorable and were made with the same amount of care and intention as anything to do with Dagothur or the Tribunal, which is extremely refreshing. One of my absolute favorite things in this whole game is a tiny quest northwest of Caldera, where you find a naked barbarian named Hlormar Winesot. He says he was tricked by a nearby witch and needs your aid in retrieving his famous axe, Cloud Cleaver. Just up the road, lo and behold, we find a female mage, and when we speak to her, she tells a very different story. That the two were traveling together and he was getting a little handsy, 
so she used a spell on him to make him fall asleep and took his axe as a lesson. Hlormar insists that she's a witch, simple as that, and can't be trusted. She's lying to you and must be killed immediately. So if you roll with the barbarian, you attack the woman, kill her, and loot the axe. Then you can either give it back to the big fella and he gives you a strength buff, or you can kill him and keep it for yourself. If you believe the woman, however, Lorimar will attack you right away, and after you kill him, the woman gives you some potions and a high five. Regardless of what you pick, you have no idea who was lying, who was telling the truth, or if they were both lying. Just like so many aspects of Morrowind, you are left in the middle just like, huh? The hell's going on? And there are just so many memorable NPCs that they could populate their own video as a whole. The first quests outside of the main story that you're most likely to experience, however, are either the Fighters Guild or Mages Guild intro stuff in Balmora. I also quite like how the main quest stops early on, and Caius kind of says, yo, you need to make a name for yourself, man. Go out, help around in town, meet some people, gain some notoriety. I just really wish, again, more RPGs did this. I know that most of us go off and explore on our own, but it's so cool that this game has you doing exactly that before you even realize it. It eases you into the type of game this is right away instead of just swooping you up on a main storyline roller coaster that theoretically be ridden all the way to the end before even touching another quest. This design choice bleeds into nearly every faction quest line which are long, involved, and sometimes require certain skills to meet level thresholds to continue. Some people hate this, and I definitely do understand why, because it feels like sometimes a way to pad out quest lines to feel longer, but when you think about it, it makes a lot more sense this way. In a game like Skyrim, sorry I keep picking on you Skyrim, you can become Archmage in an afternoon. It means very little when you could technically do this as like a thief character or a two-handed warrior, as long as you're able to complete each quest. Morrowind has you earn and justify every position, every rank you hold in the world. So overall, this is just a much more immersive way of doing things that I really appreciate. There are tons of factions to join and interact with. Some of them, like the Blades and the Ashlanders, you will be enrolled in as part of the main quest, but others give tons of option to the player given what sort of character you're wanting to play. The crown jewels of the faction system are the Great Houses of Morrowind, and there are three to choose from. In House Hlalu, the one focused on trade, politics, and prefer the imperial ways. House Redoran, focused on warrior honor and culture, and prefer the pre-empire ways of Morrowind. And finally, House Telvanni, the isolated great house focused on various practices of magic, and in-game they're currently beefing with the Mages Guild. Everyone who loves Morrowind absolutely has their favorite to join, mine being Redoran, but each give ton of rewards and quests and interesting interactions that help you really feel like you've made a decision a decision that's going to impact things for you and for Morrowind. This is helped out by how much your reputation with various factions and guilds is impacted by the ones you already belong to. And again, I hate to be like this, but it's just too bad that the next Elder Scrolls games take steps away from systems like this. It feels like they want you to be able to achieve absolutely everything on one playthrough, which is just... Uh. Other factions that you can join include the Morag Tong, the Tribunal Temple, Thieves Guild, Imperial Legion, and many more that were added with the Blood Moon expansion. On top of all of that, there are other things you might notice in your stats window. Reputation, Bounty, and Slaves. With every quest you complete, you continue to build your reputation in Legend, although unfortunately, this can only increase as you progress. Doing bad deeds and Having a high bounty on your head for committing crimes actually does not lower your reputation, so it's almost more like a quest score. The same cannot be said though for separate reputations you hold within each faction. Those are very malleable and are subject to penalty if you kill somebody or steal from that faction, amongst other things. And that final one, Slaves Freed, is interesting. So the more times in game you freed enslaved people when faced with the option, you will start to unlock quests with the Twin Lamps. They're not really a faction as much as a group of individuals trying to completely eliminate slavery in Morrowind. So there are obviously just tons of things at play here and so many ways to play and create your Nerevarine and their ideals. Now, the gameplay. The gameplay of Morrowind is probably the most hotly contested aspect of the game when people are talking about trying it out for the first time here in the present. And I am here to say definitively that the combat is okay. It's okay. It's absolutely archaic, and if you don't understand that with lower skill you're going to miss, even though you can literally see the weapon entering the enemy's head, you're definitely going to get frustrated 10 minutes in and maybe put the game down. But yet again, 
like many aspects of this game, if you just give it some time, allow yourself to learn the systems at work, you can do incredible things in this game. From spellcrafting being abused to literally fly across the entire continent to just making an awesome simple spear build, the possibilities are just crazy. One thing I love is that there are different types of attacks, which I find really fun to mess around with in regards to different weapon types. Spears are going to have a lot more thrust damage than a mace, and so on. This makes you change how you're moving around during combat depending on which weapon you're wielding, which is a really satisfying experience to me. There's just nothing like smacking an enemy with a strong running spear thrust, man. My point is that the gameplay is as deep as you want it to be, really. If you want to, all the way through your playthrough, just equip your strongest sword and swing and swing and swing, that honestly will probably work for you for the most part, as long as you just manage your stamina appropriately. I find that it's the reason people are still replaying this game like crazy now. No matter how many times you've played it, there's something else to try or a different challenge to give yourself. Getting into magic and spellcrafting really opens up Pandora's box, and I hate to admit that I haven't really done a ton of it myself, but of course the internet is chock full of crazy amateur Morrowind wizards. Itemization and gear is also much better in Morrowind than the next titles in the series. I want to start with armor. So unlike Tess 4 and 5, the armor is a little more modular in this game. You don't equip iron armor and have like pretty much everything covered waist up. Here, pauldrons, left and right gauntlets, left and right boots, helmets, and so on are all their own slots. This makes for some pretty funny clown fashion early in the game, but I really like how more immersive this system of armoring is. It feels more exciting when you track down a matching piece of the set that you've been slowly assembling. It also makes certain unique or enchanted pieces feel more special in your kit. The variety of weapons is also pretty overwhelming. Everything, thrown weapons, spears, blunt weapons, short blade, long blade, bow, crossbow, two-handed blades, two-handed blunt, one-handed blunt, staves, axes, and so on. There are just so many weapons to find and wield it'll make your head spin. I also find monster and enemy variety to be pretty damn good. There are tons of strange creatures in Morrowind to discover, and all the usual Elder Scrolls weirdness to stumble upon as far as world faction interactions, bandits, cultists, and so on. As I mentioned earlier, the game doesn't have any fast travel, but there is a sort of taxi service in the form of silt striders. It's a nice way to get around easily and kind of have these anchor points that you remember out in the landscape, a way of getting back home should you need it. This also adds to the sense of adventure. I mean, when you're out there, like really out there, it feels like it. You gotta walk all the way back to find a silt strider to get back to wherever you need to go. There's also the standard day and night cycle and weight system that you're probably pretty familiar with. These function fine, and resting forms as a way to allocate points once you've gained enough experience to level up. And you can also be interrupted during a rest if you're just out in the world by assassins, rodents, whoever decides to mess with you taking a nap while standing up, you freak. Okay, so I mentioned leveling up, and this goes along with what I was saying earlier about build variety and whatnot. But there are eight primary attributes in the game. Strength, intelligence, willpower, agility, speed, endurance, personality, and luck. Skills are completely separate from these attributes, but rely on one of them to determine ability when performing certain actions. The starting level of these attributes depend entirely on your chosen race and gender, but during character creation, you get to select two attributes to kind of be favored, tailored to how you think you're going to play. It's actually a pretty even distribution with about three to five skills being linked to each attribute, and with luck affecting zero skills. So it's a pretty open playing field and nothing really reigns supreme. Now, as for skills, there are 27 to choose from. Each class, custom, or pre-made has five major and five minor skills. Now, instead of rattling them all off, here is just a nice chart from the wiki. Some more used to the newer games in the series might think that this is a lot, but Morrowind was actually criticized at the time for removing 15 skills from Daggerfall and combining them in with others. For example, swimming being included with athletics, etiquette being included with speechcraft. Now, I personally think it's better this way. It makes no sense for a character with high speechcraft to lack etiquette, or a character with high acrobatics to not be able to jump well. Everything in Marwin feels like it has its place skill-wise to me, but with enough options to keep things fresh for multiple playthroughs. Now one final note about gameplay is dialogue and character interaction. There's a great little system of highlighted phrases that you can speak to someone about further when you're in dialogue with them. Like, hey, I need you to bring this thing to this place. That thing in that place will be highlighted, and if you click that, they will further fill you in on how to get there, some history of the location or the item, whatever. I suppose it allows you to kind of skim over things a little bit because you see the important bits in blue, but I don't think that's a bad thing. This is nothing new for RPGs of the era, but it's definitely a welcome system in a game with so much reading. So it's obvious that I love the game, but it's not without several faults that are very difficult for me to ignore. The first is a huge pain in my ass, and it's the journal. 
Ugh, it's completely unpredictable how much vital information from the quest you're given will be automatically entered here. It's also just a bitch to navigate. It's organized terribly. I really recommend finding a mod that overhauls this thing because it can just cause some serious headaches if you're anything like me. The next is glitches. Yes, I, even though this game is loved, it's still a Bethesda product. And even with the code patch from the Morrowind Nexus, which is absolutely essential, you are going to inevitably experience glitches ranging from humorous to downright quest or game breaking. I mean, you can learn to jump high enough to kill yourself, for instance. Essential NPCs can become dead before you track them down, things like that. It's an incredible sandbox of an RPG, but some things are just a little too easily broken for me. Third, now you might think this is a joke, but it honestly is not. Cliff Racers. I hate these bastards, man. Early on, these guys just take your lunch money, and even later on when you're high level, they're so buggy and annoying to fight. They aggro from so far above you that if it's cloudy, sometimes I can't even see them. Thank God my boy Jit went on a crusade and eradicated them. Now fourth is a little issue I have with combat. Again, this is partly due to the age of the game, though not completely. Sometimes animation and audio feedback lead to some serious blue balls in combat. Just not satisfying at all, where it feels like my weapon is like gliding through the enemy, even on a high damage hit. There's very little weight to different weapon types. Everything feels like you're flinging around a pool noodle. It's somewhat nitpicking here, but looking at other games released in 2002, there are some with far better animations for combat and direct feedback that feels satisfying. And finally, the depth of the game is for sure impressive, but it's disappointing when you find a cool location, talk to an NPC, and they just have the generic dialogue options. I suppose I expected too much from Morrowind at a certain point, which isn't fully the game's fault, but it always kind of let me down to realize that there's a pretty significant number of NPCs in the world that are all interchangeable. Now with the negatives out of the way, something I always wish was included in reviews is what it's like to play the game on any given day deep into a playthrough. What can I expect the bulk of my playtime to be spent doing? So for me anyway, I play RPGs very slowly. I like to read and explore a lot. I was the kind of kid that talked to every single NPC in the Pokemon Center back in elementary school. So to be honest, a lot of my Morrowind play sessions are something like 70% travel and speech, with 30% of it being combat. Of course, that fluctuates depending on which quest line I'm completing at the time and things like that, but I don't think it's unreasonable to say that you will spend a huge amount of your logged playtime reading blocks of text that give context to what you're doing out in the world of Morrowind or just poking around various towns or ruins looking for things of interest. But because this is an Elder Scrolls game and the world is just massive, there are also many play sessions where I have just simply picked a direction on the map and started walking. See what I can find that I haven't already seen. But let's also be honest, this is an RPG and you can essentially spend your average play session doing anything you want, ranging from role playing in a library to killing gods. Morrowind is a massive achievement in RPG video game design. Though parts of it are archaic and definitely annoying, the positives massively, massively outweigh the negatives. A little bit of modding can modernize the game a bit visually if that's your cup of tea, and a little bit more can modernize some serious gameplay things. And this game can still entertain you for hundreds of hours if you give the game a chance to give you some tough love early on. It also supports the greatest villain in all of Elder Scrolls and Dagoth Ur. And again, check out my Villainpedia entry if you want a closer look at him. I highly recommend this game if you haven't played it. Go run and do so now. I'm giving the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind a 93 out of 100 score. It's a must play for anyone who claims to love RPGs or grand adventure games. And don't worry, at some point I will come back and review the DLC because there's some really good stuff to be covered still. Thank you everyone for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it as I plan to do more full scale reviews in the future on all sorts of games, not just RPGs. Let me know all of your thoughts and comments down below and I will see you next time. Peace out.